how do you gauge if a startup is I wouldn't say gold mine now but if a startup yeah. is going to be a banger or not so, I know his answer that's him <laughs> fundamentally are you solving a meaningful consumer problem if you were to define three parameters that you think defines a successful pitch what would they be so this is the reality of entrepreneurship the people need to recognize if you were to become the prime minister of india tomorrow what would you do to make life easier for budding entrepreneurs one small thing i would say what is the most valuable thing that an investor has brought to your company and how do you intend to pass it on to the entrepreneurs that you're investing in from entrepreneurs that i see having a big heart is as important as a great brain Hi everybody. I've been waiting for this day since 6 and a half months. You know, 3 years back when we started this YouTube channel, the goal was to present world-class business, economic and political case studies so that we can build a business school for India on the internet. The actual dream is to build like a real campus like business school, but as of now we don't have the money. So we said, let's do as much as we can to give out world-class business education to India. And until now, by the grace of God, we've been very successful at it. So thank you so much to all of you guys who have been with us. Thank you so much for having faith in me because without you we would be nowhere. Now today we are taking our mission to the next level and here's where I want to introduce you to the Indian Business Podcast. Now with this podcast the intent is very clear. We want to pick the brains of the best entrepreneurs in the country and the world so that you can use their wisdom to become great leaders and great entrepreneurs. So two things before we get started. Number 1 if you have a great business or if you are the CEO or investor in a legendary company you can apply to be a guest at our podcast using the form below Secondly to the subscribers of Think School I got to tell you that there will be no set frequency for this podcast at all we might post once a month twice a month or just once a quarter This is because we don't want to focus on the quantity of the episodes but the quality of the episodes So we will shoot an episode only when we get a great entrepreneur, a great politician for that matter to help you understand government policies. So we're going to keep the frequency very very restricted and that might be very inconsistent. So please bear with us. If this is very clear to you, let me very proudly introduce you to the guests of our first episode who are none other than the sharks of Shark Tank India, where we pick their brains on how to crack the code to get investment at Shark Tank. So if you're someone who wants to raise money inside or outside Shark Tank, if you want to learn what is the secret of a great pitch and most importantly if you want to learn how an investor analyzes a startup before investing this episode is for you so ladies and gentlemen let's begin with the first episode of the indian business podcast good afternoon sharks my name is ganesh prasad and uh, welcome to the first episode of the indian business podcast Before we get started I've got two thank yous to give you. First thank yous from my team of Think School because we wanted to start this podcast 6 and a half months back. But we decided we will start only when we find great entrepreneurs as our guests. So today you have given us the opportunity to be here. Thank you so much for that. The second thank you is even more special because it comes on behalf of India because in the past 2 to 3 years you've been a primary instrument of business education in India. And it is only because of you that today terminologies like cac and cogs and gross margins have become household terminologies at the dinner tables of most families so thank you on behalf of india sharks today's agenda is to understand your unique perspective because you have the unique profile of being both an entrepreneur and an investor you have given capital and you have raised capital so you understand how to analyze a company how to analyze a founder better than anybody else which is why In today's episode the agenda is to put that perspective out such that any founder sitting at home will be able to understand his or her value will be able to understand how to pitch to investors and most importantly they will also be able to get a unique understanding of how an investor looks at their company if this is clear we'll get started this is founders very clear. involved in founding is fantastic uh, so today so is the founding day of your podcast that's yes. congratulations yeah, on that we need to do this <laughs> So we are like the guinea pig. We are the we are the debut answer. Yeah. Answer. No, you're very special. When the actually. when the podcast becomes very big, do remember us to give us some royalty. Yeah. But I have watched and make sure your first episode hits 10 million views. Yes. yes. But I've watched the case studies. Those do get yeah. okay. Many million views, if not double digit million views. So we so we've, I hope we've taken advisor equity, so equity. So when his podcast is really big, thank you, know, you so much. Good. 
Many best wishes. Thank you so much, Ritesh. Shaks, my first question to you is: Every investor is looking out for a gold mine startup. They would want to invest one crore, and they might want to take a hundred crore exit. Some people might want to make a billion dollars. My question to you is: How do you identify these gold mine startups, and what are the parameters that you use to gauge if a startup is a gold mine startup or not? Okay. So, I think maybe uh, yeah, I think. Radhika, why don't you start? It's okay. Okay. So I know his answer. That's why. <laughs> so Radhika is director who's speaking. Okay. Look. So I am professionally in the business of uh, giving money, uh, even outside of Shark Tank and investing. And I disagree a little bit with this whole gold mine thing. I think gold mine is an outcome, uh, and it's not an outcome that you can control. I think what is very important is input parameters, and so. i would venture that i certainly look at input parameters and i think most investors look at input parameters you can't say a company today is 100 it's going to become a billion nobody can say that with certainty in any kind of company for me i think the three critical input parameters are which is the same in all companies one is founder um, you know we always say management triumphs a certain sense of hustle a certain amount of resilience humility and a lot of focus because in early stage people tend to be all over the place i'm going to do this I, i think you've seen some of those episodes on the tank i'm going to do x i'm going to do y i'm going to do z and i have this much resources uh, to do it so i think that is one second is fundamentally are you solving a meaningful consumer problem because otherwise you are a solution in search of a, search of a problem which many products mm-hmm. are so are you solving a meaningful problem in a meaningfully large market that matters and third is your numbers have to work and you have to have a just say what we call in hindi pakad for numbers and mm-hmm. ability to do sensible business building and it has nothing to do with english and understanding of terminologies it's actually ability to sell a product and eventually make money on it mm. for me i think these are the three mm. meeta what about you so um yeah i would agree with her and i think we talk a lot about you know when you do especially early stage uh, if i look at my shark tank portfolio out of like the 25 or deals season 1 2 uh there would be maybe like only two or three that will hit this not i mean forget billion but we're talking about like you know 500 odd crore 1000 crore kind of outcomes mm. uh a lot of them will actually just not be able to survive mm. uh and a lot of them will just you know probably do well but you will not have an exit mm. so the entire angel funding math works that way mm. that you basically take very very early bets and when you're taking early bets the only thing that you can rely on is the founder so is the founder uh, someone that you really would uh, want enjoy working with is the founder somebody who's uh, resilient that you know because business models change a lot like our entire i've had three failed businesses one pivot so many good businesses have come out of a pivot now how does how can one an investor predict a pivot right mm-hmm. so you just have to take a bet on the founder and uh, the only other thing i would add to that is that um, i think in angel investing and especially if you're looking like gold mine or you know a large outcome mm. i think one of the things which a lot of founders don't think about and i didn't in my own journey and mm. i made that mistake over and over again mm. is the target addressable market mm. because uh, uh, it i've seen this in many cases including my own that you put a good founder in a small market mm. the market wins you mm. can't make a very large business out of it mm. so i think the other thing which you, it's almost faultless because mm. you have a good founder with a great product great repeats solid traction mm. um you know good fundamentals profitable but you still can't do that deal because mm. of the fact that the target addressable market is so small that mm. while there is a differentiated product mm. it's too differentiated for this to ever scale beyond 100 mm. crore and in india the classic problem is that only that mm. you know at the end of the day it's the top 1% that's responsible for almost 70 80% of the consumption yeah. and uh, predicting whether your business is getting constrained to the top 1% or even lesser 0.1% and you know when a lot of us create businesses for people like us we get that wrong because mm-hmm. you know the like when you talk about in india wealth is defined as a 10 lakh uh, plus kind of a uh, income yeah. level right so then you know, you basically get so biased by talking to people in your office in uh, your friend circle that you end up creating a product which has a very small market yeah. so i think that I, i would say that's just the other thing i would add that mm-hmm. if you are and many times we do these 
deals on Shark Tank because we get to learn. So we'll do a small market. Mm. Uh, you know, this is not going to scale beyond 50 crore. You still want to do it because you want to learn. You want to, you know, understand something. Mm. But those will not become your gold mine, so to say. Mm. I think the absolute essential um, criterion, if you ever want to think about like a like you said, thousand or billion dollar exit. Those are yeah. very large numbers. Yeah. Uh, billion dollar exit means you need to have a very, very large TAM. Yeah. Uh, which in India, very few markets have just mm. because of the fact that the average disposable income is very low still. Mm. Is there a way by which you could measure a TAM and say that, you know, this TAM is big enough for me to go? So, I think there is, of course, there are markets, if you're lucky, where TAM exists. There mm. are reports enough you know, secondary data, there'll be a Nielsen, there'll be like brands mm. uh, operate in businesses where there's a ready-made tank. There's mm. a Nielsen report, there's a Euro Monitor there's report, you can series. just, uh, uh, you know, that you can just, but there are a lot of businesses, like I would think that, you know, when, uh, when Ritesh started it mm. or when Zomato started, those are markets where you're doing something new. Mm. There you have to use proxy where you say that, okay, what am I benchmarking to globally or where am I going to, uh, you know, estimate based on you know, currently, slight behavior change is going to happen. Mm. Uh, so, what is my proxy mm. uh, where I'm saying that people are using these kind of hotel rooms and mm. that's why the room market is that or like unorganized market is that which is going to get branded. Mm. So, there you have to create and I think that's the joy for an investor when they see somebody really thinking through um, that you know, TAM. And yeah. in Shark Tank, you'll see two types of founders. One type will come and say a random number, mm -hmm. which makes yeah. no sense. And <laughs> then they have no idea where it's coming from. Mm. And then another where there was no number, but mm. they first principles, uh, say, built that number. Mm. And it just sounds logical. And yeah. I think that's, again, the difference in being able to sell your TAM. Mm. And I learned it from my journey, right? At the end of the day, you know, when we first started with a beauty subscription business, mm. very small TAM, but we kept saying, Beauty personal care is our time. But that's not correct because subscription audience is very different from beauty personal care market. Correct. So if a beauty personal care market is $6 billion, mm. within that subscription was much smaller. So that wasn't a fair way to put a time. Mm. Right? But if I were to go to the, and then when we started Sugar, if I were to go to the other extreme and say, okay, branded color cosmetics is how much, that's also not correct because I have to add branded, unbranded. Yeah. So I think there are ways to get this right, ways to get it wrong. But mm. This, when you go to your first pitch, I think the most important thing is your TAM has mm. to be large enough and has to be well thought through. Mm. Interesting. Ritesh, what's your take on this? How do you gauge if a startup is, I wouldn't say gold mine now, but if a startup yeah. is going to be a banger or not? Yeah. Look, I think, uh, I believe uh, noble intentions matter as much as noble deed. Sorry, mm. I'll paraphrase it slightly deeper. I believe that if you want to be an angel investor, <clears throat> If you begin with the intention that I have to make a lot of money, mm. you're going to be up for a lot of disappointment, my friend. Oh, that's quite interesting, actually. Because Absolutely. fundamentally, angel investment, uh, much not as much as entrepreneurship, but mm. close to entrepreneurship, mm. if you do it with a sense of wealth creation, you will hit crater many times where you would feel like the businesses that you invest in are going through troubles, liquidity is mm. down. Now, that could be due to a mix of macro, micro reasons, not mm. completely in your control or outside your control. Mm. But those are the times where you'll feel like, and during COVID, for example, a lot of people became angel investors mm. because they were seeing that money is getting multiplied. Yeah. But then the first sign of the markets going south, everybody said, I'm not doing angel investment anymore, boss. Yeah. Because fundamentally, the intentions were driven by saying, my friend make a, make a 5x, 10x, mm. I also make a 5x. Mm. Doesn't happen, work like that. Mm. Because the probability is dramatically lower. Mm. Now, that said, what could be the intentions then? Because a lot of people are doing angel investment quite successfully. Yeah. It could range from you wanting to learn about an industry. Mm. It could range from the joy of working with a founder. Mm. It can uh, range from ability to make sure that you want to make long-term healthy returns, mm. not outsized. Outsized mm. is an outcome, like mm. we're saying, rather than plan. It could be about uh, being able to make sure that you have the opportunity to invest more when mm. the company has a bigger run. I'll tell you for myself, what was the intent? Mm. For myself, look, entrepreneurship is a lonely journey. Mm. Not just for the entrepreneur. For me, I think it's still relatively better because a set of colleagues and so on. But mm. for the entrepreneurs building the company, even more lonely. Yeah. It was still early days. So I felt it was a great way to be able to partner and spend time with people who were uh, thoughtful, thinking about new ideas. When you meet new entrepreneurs, there's a mm. sense of energy in the room. Yeah. I feel like something is doing, I I want to do So it pushes me more. Uh, second thing that I feel is a big reason that I like to uh, invest in startups, I learn so much. 
Mm. I think I learn more from entrepreneurs than others because so resourceful. They're constantly coming up with new ideas. Mm. So I'll tell you, uh, Roadbase ki hamari baat hui. This is one of the companies that I invested in this season mm. with Vinita. Okay. Uh, so those folks had figured out mapping cost mm. to come down by 80% mm. by building a local storage okay. of substantial amount of location. So they don't need to send real-time pings to Google. Mm. Mm. I think that is true for almost all software costs for companies that mm. you can redesign those mm. by creating local small stacks and have better cost structures. Mm. which we also used to do when we were a much smaller company mm. but when you become big and you have like goody bida you feel like well it mm. does that half a percent make a difference yeah so i learned from mm. dil khush and road base and next week mm. uh, you know uh, we had a discussion about we will go through every gna cost of all softwares and how do you change it wow so dil khush ki companies jo paise banayenge wo alag baat hai mm. but jo saal ke 6 million dollar agle saal bachenge <laughs> that will do more than uh, enough for our company success wow that is quite interesting all of you guys mentioned about founders yeah. and you know investors often say that we don't invest in companies we invest in founders and one crazy example of the same is uh, masa yoshi san um he invested in jack ma when he knew that jack ma was an english teacher who had no background in computer science or sales my question to you is also invested in a dropout college yeah. drop out rather <laughs> than yeah. so my question is ritesh you know you might know this better than anybody what do these investors see in these entrepreneurs against whom there are all odds possible and yet and by the way this was when ebay was a very big player and they were about to go very aggressive into china and today ebay is nowhere in china and we all know where alibaba is so what are these golden traits when there is no credibility to assess what are these golden traits that these entrepreneurs exhibit because of which investors go against all odds and put in a million dollars to back them yeah look first of i think sonsan is an example of a legendary investor mm. who uh, you know bet on companies who nobody else would mm. and created disproportionate value uh, you know this is akin to what warren buffett says when people are fearful mm. uh, make bigger bets and the other way around when people are excited it's okay to just pause out mm. So I think there is no way for me to know uh, uh, what makes uh, them so successful. But I'll tell you two or three things that uh, at least I have tried to observe among the broader SoftBank portfolio companies. Mm. I think uh, one unique perspective is that you will more often than not mm. find founders who are uh, incredibly committed to the cause mm. because there's always highs and lows. Mm. Like you mentioned, I think. uh you know ebay was wanting to grow there was also local domestic competition like jingdong jd and various others there but effectively the conviction to say that i will have a 0% model mm. and use that to gain market share mm. is a tough one to be yeah. able to take but that is with the entrepreneurial insight that's one second i feel is uh at least this is my view uh, of what i have observed i think great brain is available in less quantity but is available mm. but great brain with big heart mm. as a combination is unique mm. and i think from entrepreneurs that i see having a big heart is as important as a great brain because eventually you know humans are going to work with you human are your business partners so you have to have a certain sense of um, you know empathy em- empathy uh, to be able to uh, get beyond uh, basically a sense of giving more than keeping basically your money is the first one and last one out mm. is a principle that may be valuable for the entrepreneur and last but not the least is uh, i would just say that big times like vinita mentioned like big exciting markets where you mm. can make a big difference so those are three things is my sense but i think uh, naturally mm. it's hard for me to know because i am a newbie in investment whereas okay. the person you mentioned about is a legend, legend. Yeah. vinita what's your take on this um yeah i think you know when there is no uh, you don't have a proxy of credibility in terms of uh, pedigree or you know work experience because mm-hmm. a lot of uh, times founders who've worked in funded companies find it much easier mm-hmm. to raise because they've seen that scaling up fr- up close founders with certain pedigree in the traditional vc ecosystem um not shark tank because in shark tank almost 80% capital goes to companies where founders come from the smallest of towns mm. very different uh, i mean both genders uh, uniquely because it doesn't happen in the eco uh, i mean angel investing ecosystem otherwise has say less than 3% capital going to women 
but on shark really? tank uh, yeah in shark tank like in my own portfolio more than 50% capital goes to women mm. um so i think uh, in the vc ecosystem it is still very very hard without a degree without mm. that kind of credibility uh, if i were to think about uh, you know what then stands out is resilience so mm. i think a lot of venture capitalists look at failed entrepreneurs or people who failed and had some learning from there because i think the ability the grit of uh, not giving up and you know standing up after a massive fall mm. i think uh, that's a defining uh, trait of an entrepreneur because mm. at the end of the day no matter how much you've raised no matter how glorious your market is mm. after every high there is a low and yeah. that's guaranteed and it can be you can be at a 100 million stage or you can be at a 100 billion stage mm. that the ups and downs are a guarantee mm. and so what does an entrepreneur do when they're down mm. um, you know are they going to give up or are they going to have the strength to carry on and be optimistic enough to lead their team mm. you know because there are so many times entrepreneurs have this stress of not even knowing how they're going to pay the next month's wage bill yeah. but doing town halls where you're te- motivating everybody and saying that you know we will build a fantastic business mm. that's hard yeah. so i i think anybody who's gone through that i think is probably beyond um i, I mean the most important uh, trait that i think investors look for hmm radhika what's your take on this i would summarize what both of them said and add it is execution mm-hmm. i think the ability to do long term execution mm-hmm. and i'll say something that is less fashionable mm-hmm. in india there is no shortage of ideas mm. and in any industry once you start a business there are three or four copycats that come yeah. but what distinguishes the person who survives is execution mm. and people and it is not short term execution because i mean ritesh quoted buffett if you take any investing compounding we come from a compounding industry mm-hmm. compounding happens over the long term even if you look at these shark tank investments they are not yielding dividends in 6 months 1 month 1 year if you want any of the mega outcomes that you talked about i mean i look at equity investing like mutual fund investing which is the most vanilla yeah. with a 5 year horizon i look at small cap investing with 7 years so these are 7 to 10 year journeys mm-hmm. and your ability to execute over that journey not only resilience to not get bored doing one thing mm-hmm. because sometimes when you're creating a category in india mm-hmm. so them will know this you know category creation educating your consumer set takes time the fact is in india most businesses are underpenetrated i remember we were having a conversation mm-hmm. where we said both mutual funds and makeup there is an underpenetration mm-hmm. story so that opportunity is out there for everyone to play yeah. but can you truly play the long game that is india and can you truly play the long game in your business not get bored survive regulatory drama survive an investor going away survive covid as many businesses have i think that's finally what it can can you execute profitably i mean yeah. execution is india is all about execution yeah so you're saying execution character and big heart yeah radhika i actually remember your story where you said that when radhika ma'am actually came to reliance i was an yeah. intern and she mentioned in her story i only read the script because i was not there for the talk because i was giving exams she mentioned that she was doing everything from cleaning the sink yeah to being the clerk hmm. to also taking the documents in heavy rain hmm. to the clients and the papers all got messed up and while all of her friends were from mckinsey and bcg and they were making like a lot of money so that resilience is that what you're talking about the resilience and that's the, the lonely part of entrepreneurship right yeah. you know especially when you have pedigree but even in any case you know mm. you can take the choice to go out and do a stable job mm. and have a comfortable and all of us know this story mm. have a comfortable lifestyle which your friends have and then here you are slumming it out <laughs> trying to get a document notarized manage a pantry hire people who don't want to join a startup yeah. and that comparison is tough to True. be honest i mean at forefront capital i would periodically ask myself why am i doing this i could just be a banker and make a lot of money yeah. and that is character and that the ability to just survive that for years and years and years because you don't make money quickly in entrepreneurship or as an angel investor and that for that you should do something else <laughs> Yeah, it's the slowest uh, way to make it's money. It's the slowest way to make it. It has the largest outcome. Yeah. If you survive, it just yeah. takes time. No, I think uh, to Radhika, I was remembering. I think in my early days, mm. uh, one of the hotels there was two water tanks. One tank had run out of water, and the other had full water. Mm. Guests wanted to stay in a floor mm. where the empty tank was there. Mm. 
<laughs> now I couldn't risk the guest checking out. So what do you do? You do what you're taught when you grow up. You take a pipe, blow out the uh, air, and put it between the two tanks. The pipe ran out because the water tank. Then you do the baltis. And in a larger setup, someone would call the manager and get some permission. Now, us time, पीछे से call आ रहा है. This is late night, so New York time is morning. Hmm. Somebody calls and says, "Well, should your valuation be three million dollar?" Of four million dollars, so you imagine the contrast. On one <laughs> side, millions of dollar. मतलब क्या million क्या dollar. और दूसरी तरफ वो बाल्टी time पे transfer हो रहा है कि नहीं हो रहा है. उसका reality check है. So this is the reality of entrepreneurship that people need to recognize <laughs> that there is that one percent glamour, <laughs> but that one percent glamour is very quickly takes you from that million dollar to the balti of water transfer. If you're not willing to do it, then it's not probably the opportunity. But that's the fun of entrepreneurship also. Yeah. That you can like. At that point of time, I used to think, if successful, ho gaya, so hmm. I will tell the stories. Yeah. If not, what you are. anyway, it will not matter. <laughs> yeah. Very That's interesting. Good one, Ritesh. Now let's come to the pitch. You've seen so many entrepreneurs come and pitch their ideas. If you were to define three parameters that you think defines a successful pitch, what would they be, Ritesh? Look, I think three. Uh, first is I think uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, Uh, what do you say i think uh, ability like it is sometimes entrepreneurs have a contagious sense of passion mm. like you can see the entrepreneur and feel like beyond words like you can say that you know this is a person i want to do business with mm. Mm. right like just before this radhika was saying that i'm very focused on making sure the valuation is right mm. but there was a deal that she also did mm. i know where she said i know the valuation is not good mm. but mera dil nahi maan raha You are somebody who I know will multiply because that's the reality. If you see in Indian market hmm. company, there are companies which have premium valuations. Yeah, oh, they still India get more has capital. Premium valuation. India is premium, but within India's that also there are people who have premium, correct. and they get more capital hmm. because fundamentally people believe that they will earn that and more, hmm. right? So I think that's one sense is that their founders and companies are special, and you can feel it. You yeah. can't. There are many ways you'll try to slice and dice. It's hard to do it. That's yeah. one. Second is I think naturally you would like to make sure that. uh you can feel like you can work with them and you can support them in some way or the other mm. and last but not the least is i think uh i think you will have to have a sense of whether they are doing it for the long term mm. are they battle tested or not or are mm. they basically still in because a lot of people give up right like i always feel the biggest mistake in entrepreneurship mm. is most people give up Mm. Right before their success story is going to start, mm. I'll tell you in our industry, mm. there were probably so many companies before us, mm. and people often ask, "Why did you do well?" I think my honest reality is, we just live to see the end of it. Yeah. If enough people lived, I think they would also be here. That's mm. my view. But Vinita, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, I think I would um, agree with that, and I would just say that uh, I think one of the biggest things for me is uh, humility, because mm. uh, like she said, execution matters a lot and. to execute well over 20 30 years you need to become like a learning machine hmm. and so for which you need to have that humility that i need to learn yeah. uh, from wherever i get like hmm. you know uh, and that if you don't have humility i think sooner or later hmm. uh, somebody is going to out execute you hmm. and um, second thing which i think I mean I always say that for me numbers is my love language yeah. so you know some like obviously knowing your numbers well is important mm. of course it's being gamed now on in pitches because mm. I feel that in shark tank pitches sometimes people specifically say numbers like 6.32 you know to just indicate that they are yeah. um you know they know <laughs> numbers know the and they they're going into the last decimal just to yeah. show that I know my numbers like the point zero two doesn't matter yeah yeah, uh, yeah. they really really game the system yeah. but I mean they forget that मतलब हम पंद्रह बीस साल से अपना बिजनेस भी चला रहे हैं सो वी कैन गेट थ्रू एंड आस्क यू नंबर बियॉन्ड दैट विच विल ऑल्सो यूल नीड टू नो सो येस डोंट फेक इट लाइक रियली नो योर नंबर डोंट से डेसिमल्स फॉर द सेक ऑफ इट बट यू नो यू नीड टू अंडरस्टैंड दैट एंड थर्ड आई एब्सोलूटली अग्री लाइक यू नो पैशन फॉर योर कैटेगरी एंड यू नो दैट फॉर योर कंज्यूमर लव फॉर योर कंज्यूमर आई थिंक गोज अ लॉन्ग वे बिकॉज एट द एंड ऑफ द डे you need to live to survive another day yeah. and for you to do that over 20 30 40 years you have to be able to want to do it when the money is taken out of the equation yeah. which means that yeah. even if you're not paid to do this do you enjoy this work because if you don't you're going to quit at some point mm. and it might be the just before the tipping point like ritesh mm. mentioned so just genuinely having love for your product your category your consumers and you know empathy that leads to a lot of unlocks in terms of insights mm. which your co competitors are going to miss yeah. and i think that that goes a long way in just 
compounding as well over 20 mm. 30 years so saying humility numbers and empathy towards customers yes pradeep i have a very interesting question mm. for you a lot of founders often look at the economics of investment yeah. and they decide mm. which investor to onboard yeah. for example dinda might offer 1 crore for 1% yeah whereas their neighbor might offer 2 crore for the same 1% okay so apart from financial assistance mm. what does a shark bring to the table that makes the shark an extraordinary investor as compared to an ordinary investor who is just willing to put in money look i think it's a great question because it's you know firstly every shark there i mean the before i answer what a shark brings to the table mm. there's also another message to founders that every shark who is there mm. is there because they have been in that business for 15 20 years they build something and sometimes the mistake that people make is mm. that they come in and say oh, i'm here to take a deal only from the shark by mm. the way even if you want a deal only from that shark i suggest you be nice to everyone else mm. one because you never know where life takes you mm. second you have better negotiating leverage right yeah. so you know sometimes people come in and say mujhe usi se deal chahiye and their whole eyes are focused yeah. and believe me i'm sure the rest of the panel gets very turned off so just one nice suggestion if others have made you a deal and if you are going to take someone else's deal mm. just be nice to everyone else and say thank you for the offer mm. life is long right and it's yeah. a small world but look i think people do make the mistake of seeing just capital and mm. equity is important and valuation is important but mm. really i think the question you have to ask yourself is do you want to own 100% of something small mm. or do you want to own something big mm. and now ritesh mentioned a point that you know as investors we look for founders who we want to work with mm. founders should also look at investors mm. who they want to work with because honestly it's going to be a journey and i've seen founders deal with so many different kinds of capital i was talking to one last night and i mm. said don't take money from this investor even though the valuation is great mm. because i know what the investor is going to demand they're going to call you quarterly they're going to do xyz and that will drive you nuts and mm. it will hamper your ability to execute in your business so okay. even for the found and you know these are number, what are we diluting we are diluting 1 1 and 1/2 2 3% on yeah. most deals that 1 2% if you have someone you cannot work with mm. believe me it will be a real pain people will also add value to your businesses but i i want to caution here mm. i think all of us have primary businesses to yeah. run so you can't just expect someone will come in and be a complete game changer and spend 200 days on your business i i think that's highly unlikely mm-hmm. so you should look at the value sort but i think chemistry is extremely important hmm. vida do you have an example of a portfolio company that you've worked with and in the past 2 to 3 years the company has scaled because of your experience and expertise yeah yeah so first adding on to your previous question and mm-hmm. then taking it onto this i think one of the biggest things that i think we do is uh, showing the entrepreneurs the mirror mm-hmm. because uh, as a founder many times uh, you know you have a team of people reporting to you mm-hmm. who will always you know be <laughs> like generally excited about what they're building mm-hmm. uh, the consumers you interact with are consumers and you know at the end of the day they could be very excited about so there's somebody in your entire um, echo chamber that you need who really tells you the honest truth mm. right and um i was just giving somebody the example that you know there have been times where you come out of shark tank you do a deal mm. and then you sit with the founder and tell them boss you don't have product market fit mm. and i've invested this mm. but it's going to get worse for you until you figure out product market fit mm. because so many companies coming on shark tank mm. um especially brands and i've been in that position so i understand where it is um there is you know because last 2 3 years you had access to capital or uh, performance marketing became easier mm. you are spending 20 30 40% uh, yeah. in performance marketing of your net revenue Correct. which means that it's impossible to figure out reviews are gamed mm. um and so it is impossible for anybody to actually look at the business and figure out that there is genuine brand love not a mm. club mm. or is it just propped up on the back of meta and google ads mm-hmm. right and that i think is where you first like 
get go down to the cohorts the repeats and then you start seeing patterns and you realize that yeah you could be sitting at a you know business which is like at 50 crores yeah. but they have like a 32% performance marketing and you know their cohorts at after 12 months only 25% consumers have come back mm. and then you you know start figuring out that either the pricing was too much or you know there was a problem with packaging there was a problem with the um, differentiated us use case that you were trying to sell nobody cared about it too many features mm. so there's a lot of things that you can break down yeah. and i've had many cases where you know i've really go help them like go back and question that and it you know many times uh, they are not open to that feedback but mm. the ones that are they mm. really unlock value mm. uh, but having said that i think to a- uh, answer your other question about uh, you know which are the cases so i think uh, a couple of uh, i i love working with brands because mm. for me you know that's like a, a place that i really enjoy so um, there's a company in the first season uh, called quirky nari mm. um, she basically was making custom shoes and uh, i spent a lot of time with her getting her to standardize the designs and say you're still doing the hand painted shoes and you know which is your usp or differentiator but you don't need to customize for every consumer because mm-hmm. that becomes like a barrier in yeah. scaling and then you know, so she was doing about 3 to 4 lakhs at the time of uh, her pitch airing now she's doing about 50 55 lakhs a month mm. and i think the I mean, economics are better it's a healthier business mm. uh, i think a lot of uh, times uh, founders just need to uh, get introduced to certain marketplaces certain mm. investors so um, like whatsapp wellness sephora uh, dorje you know all of these companies are doing their follow on rounds or have just done mm. and in a lot of those cases you are able to sort of put in a good word to the investor mm. and that helps them get a round which helps them go to the next level so i think mm. it happens in many cases where you are able to uh, either through your connections mm. or through just showing them the mirror mm. add some value and honestly 99.99% is the founders effort yeah. and angel can probably at best have a 0.01% impact okay. and uh, so you know would definitely not want to take credit for their success yeah uh, but yeah we do whatever we can and most some people might also expect to do spoon feed all the information right that never works at the end of the day you know it's the founders gut feel and yeah. i it's happens i mean all of us do that right you mm. like you heard the story you read case study mm. and then you do the same mistake but you have to make that mistake for yourself yeah. before you get that learning and i i mean i can't tell you how many times i have done that so for mm. me to expect another founder mm. to be like so wise that they won't still make that own mistake you know by seeing somebody else's that's yeah. not that hard Ritesh you've been through a lot of trouble from covid pre covid post covid and you were so young when you started this company so what is your take on this what what is the most valuable thing that an investor has brought to your company and how do you intend to pass it on to the entrepreneurs that you're investing in look i think um, that the two types of investors in my learning in um, at least from the folks i have met mm. they're conviction driven investors mm. and they're momentum investors okay let me define both of those for you mm. i think conviction driven investor is who fundamentally believes in the business and the entrepreneur mm. and momentum investor is one who says that they believe in the company and the entrepreneur mm. but the first sign of problem they say that well uh, i think it was somebody else mistake due to which i invested it was not my mistake and it is not wrong i think A lot of us are also like momentum investors in public market. We see one stock rising. Yeah. Sometimes people say, "Oh, that stock is going very well. I'll invest." And then when it doesn't go well, mm. you made the choice to invest. You'll say, "Oh, that friend told me. That's why I bought that share." That's in a real world. Who will take that? It was mine. It was mine. We are is momentum. We love. We all say Buffett, but we are momentum. So I think uh, you know. I think uh, I I wouldn't generalize it because on the other hand, I look at the SIPs in the market was going down. Hmm. Still, SIPs are coming in that. No, no, Massive. No, that's because it's automatic. We'll have ah, a because, longer ah, conversation. But maybe you know this better, ah, of course. <laughs> but I'm fascinated to so- see hmm. that last two three years, the amount of domestic capital coming hmm. is disproportionate, which is of course that you all are driving. That I think mutual funds are here. Can take some credit for. Hundred percent. I mean, I sorry, it's a distra- uh, I'll, uh, it's a different tangent, but I wanted to share that. I always say that if you want, if you want to uh, put money in FD. Hmm. It's probably better that the same bank hmm. you buy the bank Nifty of it. Hmm. Better to <laughs> yeah, sort of uh, uh, get, get similar. Although I'm not a financial advisor, that's just my personal opinion. Hmm. Coming to the context of investors, I think I have hence tried to make sure whenever I bring investor, hmm. I try to do at least two or three reference call on them hmm. with the other entrepreneurs that they have invested in. Okay. 
not to say yes or no, hmm. but primarily to know what am I getting into, hmm. and I encourage the investor to also do ref call on me with the other investors I have worked hmm. with, so they also know what to expect from me. Hmm. What that allows is we both know about what we are getting into. Mm. Nothing is perfect, but you at least know what are the gains and losses. Mm. So the biggest benefit I have gotten mm. is that you mentioned about the COVID and lots of tough times. Yeah, having conviction-driven investors mm. has been exceptionally valuable. Mm. Mm. That when the chips were down, they said the industry is exciting, mm. the business is exciting, the entrepreneur. Nothing has changed. Mm. What's changed is people used to travel a lot until two months back. Mm. Mm. Now during COVID, they're not traveling. Yeah. So now we have to find a way to make sure we use COVID to uh, one survive and mm. second come out stronger. Mm. So what do you do? You say that well, I have to raise cash in order to make sure that I can weather the storm. Mm. So the investor would make calls to a bunch of people and say that I have underwritten the deal. Mm. If you invest, it's great. If not, I have capital that's underwritten. Mm. That gives so much comfort to the new investor. Yeah. Second one is uh, innovation. So in that being able to make sure mapping, for example, mm. sorry we talked about it in road based context. Mm. Now kind of is mapping is like big cost. Mm. So for example, SoftBank had an, uh, has an investment in Mapbox, mm. which has lower cost, larger mapping technology, similar to Google. So we could in get introduced to them and engage. Although Google also has a great product, mm. I think uh, <laughs> no complaints. Could you elaborate a little bit on what is mapping? Look, I think fundamentally when you open the OYO app mm. and you search, let's say today we are in Goregaon Film City area, so. Mm. You search Goregaon Film City. Mm. So the map would show you five hotels being available. Mm. Mm. And it would show how many kilometers from your place that hotel is. Mm. All the way from that to after you make a booking mm. and you're reaching to the hotel, mm. uh, you know, we would know that the customer is arriving at the hotel. Okay. This is the geolocation. Of course, the customer is allowed the uh, geolocation. So I think being able to get a very deeper context of location, because in our business, maybe after cab, mm. it is the most relevant to figure which is the closest you're staying at. Mm. And is there a company that you've invested in, you've helped them scale and grow? Look, I think uh, fundamentally for me, uh, there's, uh, I would say, uh, you know, uh, quite a few that I'm quite excited about. Mm. Uh, uh, but I'll tell you one or two examples that mm. I, that are my absolute favorites. Mm. So I run a program called the, in partnership with the Naropa Fellowship, which is led by the Drukpa in Ladakh. Okay. Uh, the TL Fellowship changed my life. Mm where I got an interest-free, equity-free, debt-free grant mm. to uh, make a difference. So I try to do it. I like traveling to mountains a lot. So it's a mountain-specific fellowship mm. where I give 5 to 10 lakh rupees of interest-free, equity-free, debt-free grant mm. to companies. So there's a company there called Pahadi Dukan. Pahadi Dukan? Yes. Okay. And there's another which is called the Himalayan Chocolate. Mm. These are two of my favorite, but all the companies are fantastic. Mm. But the Himalayan Chocolate, little business, they used to sell whatever a thousand chocolates a month mm. and their only use of proceeds was that our factory is in Manali mm. or our facility, it's not really factory, facility in Manali to take stuff from there mm. to the town of Manali mm. so that it can be sent across the country. I need to buy a second hand jeep. Their business went up like 5 to 10x mm. purely with that little thing. So for me, I think bigger businesses I have made much more dollar returns. Mm. But I think these stories are always the closest to my heart. Mm. Uh, like for example, one entrepreneur that I really like, Vinita would know them, the folks at Orange Health. It's a, a diagnostics company funded by Matrix. Mm. I invested early. They gave us almost a 8x uh, or 10x return in six months. Mm. Love that company. Mm. But uh, I think they're the effort of the entrepreneurs a lot more than mine. Mm. Uh, but I think uh, in stories like these, I feel like I was able to contribute more time and effort. Mm. Radhika, is there a story that you would like to okay. share? No, so I have to confess that uh, because of compliance reasons and because I absolutely love uh, mutual funds, mm. till Shark Tank, mm. I did not have a single stock or unlisted investment. Um, Every single bit of money has been via SIPs in mutual funds. Mm. Um, and honestly, if you want to make money predictably, that, that really mm. is the way to do it. Um, so for me, actually, this set of unlisted investments mm. is, is a you know, new thing. Mm. And I'm really not into this for gigantic outcomes and mm. making money, although I still wear an investor's hat. You can't take an investment professional out of me. Mm. Um, but really, the joy is to partner with businesses mm. and partner with founders and be part of mm. uh, those stories. Actually, I think the due diligence process is going on uh, with one company. He's going to do a 
new launch. That show, ha that one hasn't aired yet, so I shouldn't mm. speak too much about it. Mm. Um, but we're already having conversations with him about his mm. fourth launch and, you know, how to restructure a product. So mm. I think the excitement is the opportunity to work with founders, mm. not the big billion dollar exit. Yeah. You mentioned about due diligence. Yeah. Not everyone sees the funding that happens on screen, but behind the scenes, there is due diligence that happens yeah. after that, right? Yeah. Could you throw some light on that? Look, so first, I think due diligence, people have to understand, is a natural thing that has to be done. Because in one, one and a half hour, with five people talking, there is a limited amount of questioning that you can ask. And mm. I, in my view, there are two kinds of diligence. Mm. One is you said X, Y, Z on the tank. Mm. Is it actually true? Mm. And does it reflect in the numbers? So those are sort of the known things that you check. Mm. Then there is a whole set of unknowns mm. uh, that you can't ask on the thing. For instance, if you're invested in a company, there's one that I have, uh, where later you find out there are a lot of loans on the books. Mm. Then as an investor, you have a right to be concerned. Mm. If you've invested in a company which doesn't have a corporate structure, because some of these are small founders, yeah. uh, then you need a corporate structure. Uh, if there is a company that has not paid taxes, mm. then that may be a liability for mm. the investors. Now, I should tell you, when we run private equity funds or funds like that, in institutional capital, diligence takes three, four months. Yeah. So if it takes a little bit of time, when all of us have to do day jobs, mm. by the way, it is par for the course. So mm. I think diligence is a natural part of the investing process. I should tell you something funny. You know, the investing community, mm. when I came out of the tank, they refuse to believe that we have no information mm. prior to investing in the companies. They're like, no, no, but they must have given you some documents. I said, no, we couldn't even walk on to set mm. to see what the display was. Mm. They're like, then how do you take a decision? And these are people who are doing investing professionally, right? Oh. So they couldn't believe that this happens because in professional investing, you have that much data. Yeah. So diligence is absolutely necessary. Mm. Very interesting. You know, everybody talks about this concept of moat. <laughs> this is my mode, that is my mode. Oh. And you know, every time I walk into a mixer, some guy comes and asks me, mm. what's your mode, bro? And uh, I'm left with two questions. Yeah. What is mode and what is my mode? <laughs> so my question is, what is mode, guys? Oh. Next time say my mode is that I'm a goat. Okay. As great as <laughs> of all time. So I got asked this question seven years ago when I started. Mm. Because they said there are 45 mutual funds. Mm. What is your moat? One mm. of these investor types asked me. I said, I have no moat. Mm. We will work more. Mm. And I said, we literally will work harder. Mm. Because, mm. I mean, you know, it's a, the, you, you are looking for a moat. Mm. We will just execute better. Which mm. means we will care about customers more. Mm. We will answer queries better. We will travel more. We will be in, more engaged. Mm. So, moat is supposed to be the reason that, I mean, moat was that wall that was created around a castle so mm. that if there was an attack, it mm. was your defense. So it's really what is your right to win and what will keep you alive mm. in the long run. I, I, that's a great answer, by the way. Goat is a great yeah. answer. <laughs> because at the end of the day, it's the execution. It's the right? execution. So it's the founding I'm, team. I'm telling matters. you, Chappal Ghiso is actually one of the finest moats. Yeah. If someone yeah. told me your moat yeah. is Chappal Ghiso, yeah. I would write them a check. Yeah. Yeah. But again, sorry. Please, please, Vinita, go ahead. Yeah, but again, I mean, practically speaking, that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah it doesn't work. Yeah, I can't so say they, that. I mean, that's what I was at the end of the day, it is execution, but... Uh, you know, nobody buys the fact that your execution will be better. Mm. So you are trying to, you know, communicate what is that little barrier that you keep building that gives you that right to win. And you have yeah. to really different companies have different modes. Mm. In our category, like the two biggest modes actually are one is of course brand, mm. right? And any brand business, the biggest moat is brand because mm. at the end of the day, uh, the reason that uh, you know, there is a, a transactional company will get valued at two or three times revenue, but mm. a solid brand will get valued at almost 10 times revenue. Mm. The difference between the two is the power of the brand. Right? Mm. The, the, like the essential saying goes, if you buy a um, lace and then you, you know, some leather and then you put it all together, um, you know, the cost of making that is probably 200 bucks, but then mm. you put a swoosh on it, mm. it becomes like 8,000 bucks, yeah. right? So that is the power of a brand. Mm. And at the end of the day, the biggest moat in consumer business is brand in our, now the emerging moats, for instance, the things that you are doing, community, right? Yeah. At the end of the day, if you've taken like seven years at a, as an early adopter to build a solid community, mm. 
uh, of uh, people who are really engaged with you, really passionate about you, mm. no matter how much the Google and Meta algorithms change, mm. you will still have like a set of people mm. who have a connection, who believe in you, who wake up in the morning and listen to you, right? Yeah. And that's what we are trying to do in beauty as a category where sugar is saying that, okay, can Indian women rely on sugar as the go-to brand for them to think about how, you know, beauty brings them confidence, right? Mm. So, uh, at the end of the day, if we teach, teach, teach for, you know, and like ha these millions of women who follow us mm. and they every day rely on us mm. uh, when they make that decision that I'm going to make a purchase because mm. India is still at a low penetration in this category mm. the first brand that they will go to is a sugar because mm. of that community mm. right so it could be community it could be your manufacturing like in pharma businesses Namita is you distribution know, from a, can be a mode distribution, distribution can in be like a mode. in our business distribution if you mm. build a really good distribution network mm. That can be a... Yeah, so but I think the most important thing is to figure out that you as a founder and you know, what is your right to win and what are you good at? Mm. And then within that, can you like very quickly compound something uh, which cannot be bought, mm. uh, which cannot be uh, really, imitated. you know, imitated or copied within like a short period of time. Yeah. And then I think that's... Sorry. Yeah, look, I think my view is that I'll probably try and add some additional context to this. Mm. Is that I first is I think moat is ever evolving. Mm. Yeah. It's like it's a uh, uh, you know battle of saying that if your enemy figures out some better way to breach the moat, yeah. it's troubles. You have to constantly evolve it. Mm. I will try and share that. Look, I think from my experience, I believe that India is a supply-starved market more than a demand-starved market. Mm. Because great quality products at the right price point, we were under penetration, ki pehle baat kar rahe the. Mm. that's largely driven because good products at the right price point have not been available historically. Mm. And once they become available, mm. uh, they can become very valuable. And hence, to do it, you have to figure supply chain, distribution, lots of other things. So for example, think about telecom. Mm. Uh, Reliance Geo's uh, moat is the amount of infrastructure and pipes they have gotten. Yeah. Now for a new company to go set up a business like that is mm. very, very hard. Mm. Um, similarly, if you were to think about, again, I'm, uh, if you have a, a television rights mm. for IPL for next 10 years. Mm. Or Shark Tank. Or Shark Tank. Mm. <laughs> you could be, you yeah. could be very, very successful. Yeah. Mm. Or for example, for our business having term contracts of exclusivity with our hotels for um, them allows a mode. So I think the simple way to think about it mm. is that I am doing business in my business mm. when somebody else with much more money and muscle power mm. and when I say muscle, capital muscle mm. if they were wanting to try and enter this same sector mm. they would face challenges beyond what I uh, faced. Mm. What is the additional barrier I have created beyond whatever the industry has. That's how I look at it. Competitive advantage that is not easily replicable yeah. in a short period of time. Mm. Yeah. My last question, uh, 30 second answer. If you were to become the Prime Minister of India tomorrow, what would you do to make life easier for budding entrepreneurs? <laughs> One small thing I will say, because there are a lot of big things. Okay. But the smallest thing is remove ESOP taxation at the time. Okay. You know, it should be at the time but of sale. It's gone, Vinita. It's coming. And the next one is coming. ESOP the big one is coming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Radhika, what about you? Uh, say Shark Tank uh, and this kind of experience needs to... I think you just need to make entrepreneurship popular in every household. Mm -hmm. By the way, I also think this government has done a great job of mm -hmm. doing it. So, I am not going to ask for mass. Mm -hmm. I think take what's being done and just keep carrying it forward. Mm. Celebrate success of business people. I always say, you know, these billboards were up in Mumbai. And I'm sorry, this is a long answer. And my driver was like, Madam, a billboard pe hai. Pehle to actor logon ko dekhte the. And I think it's a very deep statement that, mm. you know, we are celebrating the success of business yeah. when role models used to be just actors and cricketers and yeah. now they're on buses. So these are just billboards. This is, they, these are on billboards, they're on airports, they're on bus stands, they're on metro stands because I get these pictures. And I think that's an amazing thing for that's the common person. They're all over. Yeah. No, so I think first off, I think uh, uh, I, I will not g give context from a perspective of um, uh, uh, the leadership that you mentioned. But as an entrepreneur, mm. I can share that um, last six years, what has changed? Mm is becoming an entrepreneur earlier went from unacceptable mm. to acceptable to becoming a great opportunity. Mm. My mom used to always tell me that tum na galat sangat mein pad gayo jinhone tumhe entrepreneur bana diya. <laughs> because parents always think that their child is always correct and yeah. everybody around them is influenced them True. to pursue it. 
but first time she mm. watched uh, startup india in television mm. at january shark tank no startup india in 2016 mm. and she saw this on national television that there were entrepreneurs being celebrated and talked about that's the first time she told me or messaged me saying you must be doing something right mm. right so i think naturally if that's happening in my home that's happening mm. in a lot of others home yeah. because my mom wanted me to get a job at tcs infosys that would have like पूरे गांव में मिठाई बढ़ती उस दिन सेम ब्रो राइट लाइक इफ आई गॉट अ 2.5 लाइक जॉब लाइक एकदम बॉस लाइक द होल रायगढ़ा वुड बी गेटिंग लड्डू दैट डे राइट मॉम वुड हैव मेड इट हरसेल्फ तो एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप इतना अनरिलेटेबल है ना hmm. वहां से कि उनको बड़ा कठिन होता था बट hmm. वो देखा तो उन्होंने कुछ इंटरेस्टिंग है बनता है तो मुझे लगता है कि बीइंग एबल टू जस्ट मेक एंटरप्रेन्योरशिप एन एक्साइटिंग प्रोपोजिशन जैसे आप यूएस देखें यूएस सिविल वॉर ड्रिवन था and there were people like jp morgan vanderbilt and duke carnegie who translated us from a poor economy to the world's most dominant economy now close to a century yeah so my perspective is if india has to become a developed economy naturally entrepreneurs have to be forefront just like it. the american dream we need the indian dream to be Absolutely. aspirational indian dream right behind you yeah. india Thank is you. the new american dream yeah. even for americans But they also want to come exactly. invest here you guys are by the way the flag bearers of those dreams yeah yeah absolutely Thank you so much guys thank, thank you so much for your thank time you. Thank to you. the entire think school community you know what to do as usual if you found something valuable in this entire podcast i'm calling it podcast now it's not an episode anymore it's a podcast do hit the like button to make youtube baba happy and for more such insightful business and political podcasts do subscribe to think school thank you so much i'll see you in the next one bye bye